interaction, and I leave at the bottom of every column an email address at which I can be contacted. A hate mail ban is something of an occupational hazard for me. And since beginning my life as a Saturday columnist in September 2009, I think I've amassed something of a respectable pile of hate correspondence. And I say respectable rather than impressive because sometimes I feel a little disappointed that I haven't received more um, hate mail. Uh, I mean, often I'll sit down and check my inbox and if I don't receive a few letters uh, that suggest I'm either a cretin, a moron, a Zionist big Australia stewardship group of Murdochs, or part of the vanguard of Asian invaders intent on destroying white Australia, <laughs> then I feel like I haven't quite done my part. Uh, and there are all things, by the way, that I, that I have been uh, caught by uh, readers. Now, some of you are probably, no doubt, thinking that I'm something of a masochist for celebrating my receipt of hate mail. Um, perhaps that's true. But I think there's some truth in the idea that all writers uh, are in some way masochistic. I think there's a wonderfully romantic, artistic ideal of suffering uh, for your art or for your craft. Uh, but there's another reason, I think, why writers or newspaper columnists anyway don't mind uh, getting nasty hate mail. Namely, if you're at the receiving end of abuse, it probably means that you're dealing with matters where something is at stake. And in any case, being in the business of public debate means that you need a pretty thick skin. And I suspect most communists are like being figuring that given that's the case, you might as well take some pleasure from the argy-bargy or rough and tumble. Now I came to this realisation pretty early, I think, in my foray into journalism. I should note here that I'm not Strictly speaking, a journalist. I'm not a full-time journalist, or I'm trained as a journalist. But when I was completing my doctoral studies in England a few years ago, I went through the usual uh, soul-searching, self-loathing, if you will, that a PhD tends to inspire. And in my case, this led me to try my hand at newspaper journalism. Now, one of the first outlets of my writing was the Guardian newspaper's comment is free website. I uh, don't know if you read The Guardian, but readers of The Guardian will know that this is no place for the faint-hearted or for those with glass jaws. Commenters on the website with the benefit of anonymity, of course, can offer pretty robust feedback. Uh, quite often they're ruthless, if not downright nasty. I probably didn't appreciate this entirely when I set forth in March 2008 and began writing is free. My first article was something of an assessment, admittedly optimistic, uh, of Gordon Brown and New Labour. But the reception I got from the Guardian's uh, readers was rather more vicious than I had expected. In fact, when I went back to the Guardian's online archives last week to uh, check all that again, I, I, I think I went still there as I read some of the comments. I mean, it was harsh, um, pretty brutal. And had I been lacking in a healthy dose of ego, or had I been less of a feet jam personality, to use that uh, vernacular, I think it might have put some in my ambitions to become a newspaper columnist. Let me show you what I mean. Oh dear, wrote a commenter by the name of CJ CJ. Quote, this rubbish will be flamed good and proper, and rightly so. And CJ was pretty spot on about the flame because as you scroll down the page, you We've got comments, why well, comments like, what a load of guff, or crap like this is really turning me off this paper, or pure trap. Uh, one wrote, well, I'm a bit reluctant to criticise and judge someone on their first piece, kind of the defence of, some of my best friends are X or Y. Uh, this one from Tim Supermassan is poor, that's spelled out in capital letters. And there's others who said it's the type of article with its inability to really criticise Gordon Brown that is giving the Guardian a bad name. I love the fact that on the basis of the first article, you're already giving the newspaper a bad name. But there was one comment that we seemed to uh, express some more balance, at least on, on first reading, but then he slipped the dagger in me just as I was least expecting it. Uh, here's what he said. Wow, that's a lot of negativity and anger on this thread. Does no one have anything nice to say about this piece? I mean, I know I don't. <laughs> it reads like a shoe shop attendant thinking aloud to herself. 
I'm not sure what my cobbler would think of that remark, but I don't think that was meant to uh, be a compliment at all. It was baptism of fire. But I took solace in a number of things. It was clear to me that a lot of the commenters were really dispensing their anger, in my case, their anger about New Labour and Gordon Brown. And given at the time that New Labour was starting to get well and truly on the nose, I, I really had it coming. I mean, the equivalent of what I was writing uh, would be praising New South Wales Labour uh, last week or uh, complimenting the policy leadership of Mark Harbid and uh, Carl Guitar. I mean, that's the kind of proportion we're talking about. But as a general rule, if you have genuine conviction and belief in your judgment, you can't get yourself down on really feedback. In my case, I kept on writing for the government's comment page. The nasty comments kept on coming. But then a few months later, I found myself working shifts, writing leaders for the Guardian. And for those who are familiar with newspaper speak, that means writing for newspapers unsigned editorials. So I was grateful, at the very least, that the Guardian's editors didn't look at the comments on their own comment website. But my great time at the Guardian taught me one thing, and that's that is that good newspaper columns should expect to attract criticism if not abuse. Uh, and I had this illustrated to me in very dramatic terms one day when I was in the Guardian's office. And I was sitting opposite one of the political columnists, uh, Jonathan Friedman, uh, who I think is a great columnist um, in the newspaper. But I watched, I watched him exclaim, oh my god, um, at his desk. And sure enough, the whole editorial staff came behind his computer screen because what was happening was his inbox was being flooded by thousands uh, of emails because he had written something that had upset some uh, Republican bloggers in the US. But at that moment, as I was standing there watching all this unfolding, I, I think I thought to myself, wow, you know you've really made it as a comments when you start getting barrels of hate like that. As you can probably tell, I like to share my hate mail uh, with my friends. Um, friends. Um, so much so that one of my colleagues once asked me, do you get any fan mail at all? Well, as it happens, um, in my defense, um, I do. And the history of my reader feedback and correspondence uh, isn't all negative. Uh, if anything, it's a story of the good, the bad, uh, and the ugly. But when it comes to generous reader appreciation, I think I reached my peak in late 2008. Uh, at the time, I I was writing for the Financial Times, so I left the Guardian um, once again in London. Maybe it was because I had no financial literacy, but I found myself very quickly assigned the regular role of writing what the writers they called the Saturday Shorty um, for the paper. It was a brief, a little whimsical, light-hearted leader uh, on Saturdays. Uh, Roman is horrible about the need to impose a tax on the overweight and obese, a fat tax. And that prompted Gemini Laird, a reader who quoted um, a letter from the Scottish philosopher David Hume in 1751. Um, I won't read it to you, but it's fantastic. Lots of capital letters, as you know, the letters back then were being written. Another shorty about Australians and our love of work, uh, the editor had the sick idea of giving the sole Australian on the leader of his staff the task of writing an Aussie Bay editorial. I almost choked on my vomit. Um, proved I'd been killed in the FT News Hall uh, room, although I hadn't told anyone until now that it was me who wrote it. And then there were the letters about my editorial on the Italian government's bailout of Parmigiano cheese. Yes, um, you may not know this happened, but in 2008, the Italian government bailed out Parmigiano makers in Italy to the tune of 50 million euros. But I was struggling. I, I didn't know what to write. And desperately seeking something half amusing, I resorted to that lowest form of humour, the pun. I mean, this leader had every cheesy pun, as it were, um, you could think of. So there were references to Mr. Luca Zaya, the Italian agriculture minister, as the big cheese in Rome. Yes, you saw that one coming, didn't you? Um, there were references to the bailout grazing uses of other cheese varieties, uh, to how the blood of some economic observers had curdled at the thought of, sorry, just let me finish, uh, at the thought of the ministry bailouts, to how 
mozzarella makers feared that that tipping into sort a of fondue government cash, they too would fall by the wayside. <laughs> Thank you. There's more. Um, wait, there's more. Um, and I finish by saying, unlike the cheese itself, the case for protecting Parmesan has not been easy for some to digest. Now, I can tell you that this is the only article I've ever written that prompted newspapers to publish in their first page. Famer, praising me for my wit and alleged brilliance. Um, and if you'll forgive me uh, a moment for being wildly, wildly immodest, this is a soapbox for God to all. Uh, a reader from New Jersey in the States uh, wrote that the piece, quote, is an extraordinary tour de force that covers the bailout topic, con brio, with a weakness that is rarely found in the mainstream press. Even the New York Times weighed in and made a note of the piece in an article documenting the cheese situation in Italy. And according to that venerable newspaper, uh, quote, the coverage of the cheese bailout in the English language press has inspired a sort of arms race of pain. But no one, the newspaper said, took things quite so far as the author of the Financial Times editorial, who left no pun unturned. It all verged of being a little embarrassing. I mean, seriously, the ratio of puns to paragraphs on the piece was so bad. I think I found it hard to look at my colleague's face when I turned up to the OT the next week. I still suspect, by the way, that the cheesiness of that piece had some bearing on the newspaper's decision not to keep me on as a full-time <laughs> leader. Whatever the case, not long after my hopes of becoming a financial journalist were dashed, I returned to Australia. Which brings me, of course, to my experience of reader correspondence here. Now, I received a good number of letters from readers of, of my column. Some weeks there can be a dozen or so letters, but some weeks there can only just be one two. It really depends on the topic or the mood of the reader, I suppose. Now, some are one line emails expressing a reader's total agreement with what you've written. They're always nice to receive, I'll be honest. Uh, but some are 10 or 12 paragraph. Uh, long letters. Um, I still get sent letters in hard copy too that are handwritten um, or typed up in capital letters or in erratic font. Um, I don't know why the reader has disagreed with absolutely everything I've written, from the premise to the evidence to the conclusion. I think the only respite I have is that I don't have big teeth like Erin Jane, um, who shares the page uh, with me on the newspaper. Um, she, is, she apparently gets a lot of mail complaining about the big teeth. Um, <laughs> But anyway, many columnists stick to the general rule that they shouldn't respond to letters. The British columnist Michael Young, who for many years wrote for the Guardian, once wrote that a column should speak for itself. It's good advice. I, however, like to answer some of my mail. Now, there are, of course, some that are better left unanswered, so I tend not to respond or Golfing here because I don't know if there are any around in this room, but I tend not to respond to climate change denials. I always write in when I cite um, evidence on climate change. And I tend not to respond either to readers who write in complaining that the RSPCA's targeting of certain aggressive dog breeds constitute a form of genocide. Their word, not mine. I tend not to respond to that. But there are other kinds of letters that I think merit a response. So when a reader has taken the time to write, considered critique or response to a column and clearly written in good faith, I think courtesy and good manners demand that I write back. So I do. And the majority of my letters uh, that I've received from readers of the week in Australia can fall into this category. But then there's another category. Now I receive mail that you might describe as uh, somewhat more robust uh, in nature. Now, no, it's, it's usually written by intelligent readers, but they're, they're the ones who find my political views or style fundamentally objectionable. Some are old school Trotskyites, such as one reader who accused me of limiting discourse and limiting disagreement with the logic of the state. Quote, you do much to close down the public conversation, but by dramatically narrowing what can be said and understood, a sort of newspeak type operation. Quote, this particular reader went on to assure me that this was more than simple ideological mesentente. Yet some readers of the more conservative persuasion charged me with a rather different crime. So I had one letter from a reader called Jeffrey, 
that suggested I needed to retrain in philosophy, I just retake philosophy 101. Uh, quote, you would be all advised to retrain so that the awful non sequiturs, scrambled thoughts, and random quotes don't continue to expose you as a cerebral, incontinent, crypto pharmacist <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, I've come to regard cerebrally incontinent crypto Marxist poser as a badge of honor. Thanks, Jeffrey. <laughs> but then there's a category of correspondence that I think truly merits the description of hate now. You're probably thinking, oh, geez, you know, this complaining, this isn't hate now, this is just all fun and games. But in my case, every now and then I get correspondence I can classify as bigoted or racist character, and it usually happens whenever I write about national identity or multiculturalism or culture or race. Now when I tell some of my friends and colleagues about the nature of uh, the matters I receive, they usually think I exaggerate. So here's a sample of the kind of hate mail of this sort that I've received. The following is from someone called David in response to a piece I wrote about Australia then. Apologies in advance for the language, but it's best that I read that as, as it was. Uh, quote, it's very simple, mate. Love or leave it. Go get a job that does something in this country. Join the army and go fight the Taliban. Otherwise, you have no place to comment or any right to voice your pathetic, unwanted, worthless opinion. I love my country, and I've put my life on the line defending it in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I shit on people like you. The message is simple. Don't like it. Fuck off. That's from David. I picture David sitting there at his computer after he typed this kissing his flag and someone cross tapping his biceps. <laughs> Here's another one from a reader called Mark. I've just written a column on biomedical technology. I suggested that uh, using biomedical technology for moral enhancement, so not physically enhancing yourself but changing parts of your behaviour, um, could go to as an act of self improvement. Here's what Mark wrote. Yes. So let's start with Asians, yourself included, given that they're the most racist of all peoples on the planet. You know it's true. What is it with Asians and race? Yes, what is it with us and race? <laughs> Here's another from Jeffrey. Um, and I seem to get a lot of mail, by the way, from a man called Jeffrey. <laughs> uh, in response to a piece I wrote about cricket and the selection of Usman Kalanja for the Sydney Test match earlier this summer. And I made a passing comment about how how I used to play cricket growing up in southwestern Sydney, which as many of you know is like an ethnic melting pot uh, of Sydney. I mean, it's something like 40 percent of people in the area don't speak English at home. Um, but I, I found that when I, whenever I played cricket, I was more or less the only Asian uh, boy in the cricket field. So I made a remark that uh, uh, the cricket field in those parts of Sydney was still a sanctuary for Anglo-Australians. Not an obvious judgment, just an observation of fact as I experienced it. But here's what Jeffrey uh, wrote in response. Quote, more Asian anti-white racism, more Asian arrogance from a bona fide Asian racist. So Asians taking over the education system is equality, is it Tim? This is why the white Australian policy was put in place Tim. To stop Asians taking over and Aussies who want to protect Anglo culture is jingoistic and nasty. And is, I haven't changed from the letter that's what he wrote. Even though it's grammatically incorrect. <laughs> Asians good, whites bad. Good one, Tim. I'm glad we got that one sorted. Where are you from, Tim? Last was it? Laugh out loud. Go home soon, Tim. If you feel an Anglo Saxon country with an Anglo Saxon legal system and government doesn't suit, I've got news for you. You came here from a failed Asian country and a failed inferior culture. Feel free to leave. The sooner, the better. Just when you thought that there was no one left interested in any white Australia. Um, and for the record, I was born in France, um, and um, I like white Anglo-Saxon Australians. Uh, my girlfriend is a white Anglo-Saxon Australian. Hell, I even used the name Tim <laughs> rather than my actual Lao name. Now I could go on, but there's a lot more. And there's a lot more where this uh, came from, but I think you, you should get the general idea. In most cases of racist hate, and I don't respond, when there's so much anger and hate, you know you're dealing with people who aren't really perhaps have a 
reason exchange that are either blowing off steam or seeking to intimidate you or perhaps both. But there was one occasion when I did respond. And it was in response to the following from someone called Fred, not Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. um, the letter arrived after an Australia Day piece in 2010 it began, quote, 10, 10, 10. One, you will not born you. And that's a you that you not quite you. <laughs> you have no ancestral background here. Two, you're Asian. Three, you're a left wing academic. Four, did your relatives fight on foreign battlefields to keep this country free? No, he's not in pain. <laughs> and he continued, you, of course, are only interested in the pillory of white Anglo Saxons, which makes you nothing but a racist. Spelled R A S C I S T. <laughs> now, I actually responded uh, to this reader and I essentially told him to get stopped. Um, I thought I gave this as good as what I got. But what I didn't expect was for the reader's wife to respond. Here's the response. Dear Tim, hi, how are you? I definitely agree with you in every way. By the way, this is Cynthia talking to you now. The other person at all is my husband, Jeff, who calls himself Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for Jeff's rudeness and bad language skills. I'm Iranian myself, so I can clearly see your point of view, but what can we do? Each one is entitled to their own opinion. Keep up the good work as it seems racism and minority group hate seems to be on the rise. God bless you. What can you say to that? <laughs> Some concluding thoughts. The business of public debate, as I said, is no place for pussycats. You have to love the debate, you have to love the disagreement, you have to love the conflict. And I do. Now, once upon a time, when people actually gave speeches on a soapbox in a street or a park corner. When are we going to do that, by the way? When are we going to take this out and turn into the parks? Uh, once upon a time, soapbox talkers had to contain things. In fact, I, you know, I was with John Fain uh, earlier this week, and I was inviting Hackers to turn up, so I'm really disappointed no one did. Uh, but it was part of the fun, part of the carnival of rhetoric. And I suppose I see rigorous exchanges with readers in very much the same vein. In general. But there are some cases of correspondence that give me reason to pause. And I think expressions of leadership and racism, uh, I don't like invoking uh, don't like invoking the word racism, but if it does exist, and it does exist, uh, always have that effect. Can we have a world without hate mail? No. Of course we can. In any case, I think my world will be a little poorer without the occasional bar vitriol personal tax. The truth of the matter is, I get something of an unlikely pleasure from receiving my racist hate mail. We all, every one of us, have small, sometimes grotesque pleasures in life. And for me, there's a certain pleasure in knowing that there's nothing that might infuriate my typical angry hate correspondent more than seeing a yellow man with saintly eyes with an unpronounceable ethnic last name, an anglicised first name, gazing in the pages of the weekend Australia. <laughs>
or writing. Um, that's something I, I don't have uh, a set view on or a clear answer on because I, I think it's very hard to adjudicate when an instance of speech has caused the requisite harm for an instance to be shut down. Um, you know, John Stuart Mill um, gave the example of uh, a mob outside the corn dealer's house. This was in the 19th century, of course. Um, but he said, you know, he was a seminal defender of free speech from a liberal, smaller liberal perspective. But he said, if someone is standing outside a corn dealer's house saying death to corn dealers, there's a mob, that's when free speech should be shut down. I tend to, I tend to see myself as a, as a million uh, in that sense. Um, and sometimes the best response to bad speech or to hate speech is to speak back. Um, so thank you to the Wilson for giving me a chance to speak back in, in this case. Given what you've said, I'm just wondering if you could comment on <coughs> how you would describe the level of political discourse in Australia, given some of the recent uh, exchanges that we've seen. Well, it's it's uh, it's not nice, I think, to to have to like. I'm a political theorist, so I take a particular interest in uh, in political debate. But it's not nice to see science uh, written about politicians in a way that emulates the American Tea Party. I don't think that really belongs in our, in our debate. You can have disagreements, you can have fierce disagreements, uh, but I don't think that uh, personal revenge has really been the Australian way. Uh, I, I don't think it's really defined Australian debate uh, until very recently. And I think the clear reason why that has been the case is because there are groups in our community who believe that they can make the most political headway if they adopt the tactics that have been used by the American Tea Party, Sarah Palin, uh, Glenn Beck, and others. So I, I do have a, a lot of concern about that because, quite simply, I don't think it advances debate and entrenches hate and creates division. Um, I guess I would like to see something better and more high minded, something more in the, the interest of the common good, if possible. Um, are you conscious of the unending attacks by your newspaper on the federal government? And if you are conscious, is there anything, do you agree with it? I always used to get the Australian, but I've stopped getting it because it's just one continue. Everything the federal government does, the weekend Australian in particular, just finds fault with it. It's just on and on, every columnist, as if they're getting paid by some editorial policy or by the owners to attack the government. Well, I, I assure you I've never seen Rupert Murdoch, um, and Rupert Murdoch has never gotten in touch with me, but I hope he agrees with my column. Um, now, you know, columnists are always grateful for, um, for a platform. Uh, the Week in Australia has been uh, very good in promoting uh, debate uh, from my perspective. Um, do I agree with the newspaper's editorial line? Um, there are many cases and issues where I probably don't agree with the newspaper's editorial line. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a division, I suppose, between the editorial section of the newspaper and, and the uh, comment uh, writers uh, who, who write them. I'm not in the newspaper uh, offices. I don't have uh, any direct say in what the line of the newspaper uh, is, but I, I certainly hope that you all go out and get the weekend in Australia and find, or we found it for one column, um, <laughs> on that page of, of, of inquiry. Um, having said that, I, I, you know, I, while I disagree with uh, some of what the newspaper says, I, I still think it's, uh, it's an important voice in our debate, and uh, the reporting, I think, is second to none. It's, the, it's not just the editorial, it's the columnist, virtually all of them. Frankly, I have time. Next week we'll be hearing from Leslie Cannot about the problem with feminists. Um, but please join me in thanking Tim Supazan.